Um, a lot of the times when we're looking at this digital marketing landscape and what publishers and authors can do to make themselves more findable and more shareable, we tend to look at the future. And what I'd like to actually do is take you on a bit of a journey into the past. Uh, part of the reason I do that is because sometimes when I get introduced, they'll call me a futurist. And I always sort of say, I don't really have any crystal balls on me. Um, I'm actually more of a presentist. And I think that in looking at the publishing industry in particular, what I can tell you is that you have this amazing opportunity. And I think you know, what Bob showed earlier was just an, an, an indication. Uh, but it wasn't an indication necessarily of you as a professional in the book publishing industry. What you need to be able to understand in the little journey we're going to take together is that uh, as scary as this might be for many of you and as, as radical as this change might be, this is your opportunity. You will never, in, probably in the publishing industry, since the, pre the Gutenberg Press came into advent, have this opportunity. I mean, most professionals went about their days in your, in your, in your industry. You're going to be the people at the front line of this. You're going to be the people that they'll look back to 10 years from now and say, what did you do uh, during this amazing revolution or evolution? I actually truly believe that you're in a revolution. And the story that I'll parlay you to my world, digital marketing, is about Cortez. Uh, Cortez, widely regarded as the person who discovered Mexico, uh, which isn't true. He, he conquered Mexico is actually the, the truth of the matter. And I know that that's true because I read it on Wikipedia, so it must be accurate. And um, Cortez is, is, is it's fascinating when you think of these times because we, we've sort of glorified them through very, very uh, cheesy miniseries movies that we see. And you think about this moment in time and you probably can envision these beautiful boats made out of oak and these white masts moving through. But the truth is, is that if you've studied history uh, and this moment in time, what you know is that when Cortez and his crew finally arrived on the shores of North America, they were in very, very bad shape. Uh, they were lacking some very primitive technology that we all take for granted. Uh, they didn't have things like air conditioning. Uh, they didn't have GPS systems. Uh, there was no Twitter. It was very barbaric back then, right? And as, as Cortez and his men were making their way in, inland, a couple of his men moved forward and said to him, what's the plan? How long are we here for? When are we getting out of here? And Cortez did something really dramatic. Uh, he burned the ships. No going back, only going forward. Imagine if Bob showed up at your office and just started setting things on fire, right? <laughs> sort of the analogy you have, right? You, just, you can't go back to the way it was you have to move forward. Now, as a digital marketing professional, this story really struck me. And I think it will stri strike you because it's very linear to, to the publishing world, which is I, I had this moment where I realized it's true. The things that we're actually doing in digital marketing to promote these publishers and these authors is very traditional. I mean, look at the formats we have. We have banner advertising, display advertising, we have email marketing, uh, all these things we've seen before. I mean, a banner ad is a billboard, it's a magazine ad. Uh, email marketing, it's direct marketing. We've done that before. And that if you actually look and think about it, the media is so fundamentally different that we actually have to rethink what we're doing to connect to these consumers, to these readers, to these people who are buying our book. And so the story of Cortez really struck me, but then I realized, you know, maybe I should modernize it for the modern age, and I have. And what I want publishers to really do, what I want authors to really do, is, is this. Uh, I want you to control Alt-Delete. I want you to consider a reboot. So you don't have to torch the computers. You don't have to, you just have to reboot. You have to think differently. Now, when I had this idea of control Alt-Delete, um, I wasn't, I, I live in Montreal, and I have an office in Montreal and Toronto. I employ about 130 people. And so when I'm in my office, I can sort of be a big shot. People like me. They, they think I'm cool. It's great. But when I'm blogging, I don't know if any, any of you blog, it's a very different experience. I'm home in my boxer shorts in the den uh, blogging. So I don't have my team, and I don't feel all that important when I'm doing that. So I blogged about this idea of control, alt, delete, and I hit publish. And you get a little nervous. You sort of sit back and hope you know, the world's going to accept this thought that I have, this thought that perhaps we actually really need to rethink media in this world, that the advertising and marketing channels we're trying to build cannot be built on the history of old traditional broadcast models, that we have to re-envision what it is like to connect to consumers in this world. Um, and I'm nervous that this idea will not be accepted by my peers. And then a couple days later, an interesting piece of data came out. What it showed was, and it's from Comscore, and Comscore, for those who don't know, is a measurement um, company, much like Nielsen is for TV in, in the US. And what they uncovered is that from 2007 to 2009, uh, the percentage of people actually clicking on banner ads had dropped 50%. I mean, think about that. You have many people in the publishing world 
newspaper world coming forward and talking about this digital first posture. This idea that we're gonna be digital and online advertising. And I'm like, have you seen the data and information? Uh, we've actually been validated this concept that if we're trying to simply blast messages at consumers to buy a book, to uh, buy an audio book, whatever it might be, that this is just simply not working. In fact, they're now delineated this to the point where they don't even call them banner ads anymore. They call it display advertising because they talk about the branding effect of it. And as a marketing person, I definitely believe in the branding effect, but the branding effect is fundamentally different from this idea that we as marketers can put an ad for one of your authors in the exact type of area where people look for this type of content, and then because your message is so awesome that people will take action. They will click on it, they will read a preview, they will send you an email address, they will buy the book. It has not worked. And it has not worked because this traditional mindset in this new media is completely flawed as, as far as I'm concerned. And so we have to think about what this means to control all delete. So I have 30 minutes, so I'm gonna do three things in 30 minutes. I'm gonna show you a bit of what this media landscape looks like. Not in terms of necessarily even how we got here, but what do we do now? Uh, I've got some pretty mind-blowing stats, which now I have to deliver on, so let's hope I can do it. And some provocations. Uh, I think today, and any time you attend an O'Reilly conference, specifically a Tools of Change one, you will be provoked. And I think that it is these provocations that will make you better as a professional in whichever field it is that you serve. So, what do we do? How do we look at this? I have uncovered in my you know, 20 plus years in being in digital now that the biggest mistake people like me tend to make is they get up on stage and tell you what you should be doing. This is what you should be doing with Facebook, this is what you should be doing with YouTube, this is what you should be doing with Twitter. And I've come to recognize that if all you do is tell people what they should be doing is you just wind up shooting all over them. And I don't wanna do that. So what I wanted to do is, is look at what these customers look like. And I've actually spent the past half decade looking at consumers. And I'm here to tell you that the consumer of today looks nothing like your consumer of yesterday. And I don't mean the consumer of today versus five years ago. I mean the consumer of today versus the consumer of 24 hours ago. Uh, that's how dramatic this consumer has changed. They look nothing like anything we have ever seen to anybody we've ever sold in the history of commerce. And I know that may sound dramatic, but it's true, and you'll see how this plays out. Uh, this is Sam Decker. Sam Decker, at the time of this picture, was the chief marketing officer at a company called Bizarre Voice. Now, Bizarre Voice is the company that does all the third-party customer reviews. Not for Amazon, but if you go on Walmart and other companies like that, you'll see the customer reviews, five-star ratings, all the semantics. And so Sam is invited to speak at an event in Chicago that's being put on by this gentleman. This is Andy Cernovitz, who's the founder of the Word of Mouth Marketing Association. Uh, Andy runs an event called, uh, uh, it's called Word of Mouth Super Genius, and it's all about thinking about how to build word of mouth differently. And Andy invites myself to come up and speak. Uh, I call this picture Emo Mitch, just I'm never really sad, but I thought it was a funny picture someone took of me. I, I, I made a little frowny face. Now, you're probably noticing a trend with the three of us. I don't know if you can pick up on it. It's not that we're all white. Um, yeah, so uh, we're all fairly follically challenged, as you can tell. Now, uh, I had been traveling a lot that day, and I had actually gone to, like, down south a little bit, and then I flew back home, and then I flew to Chicago, and I got to Chicago and this dinner a little bit late, and I came in a little frazzled, and I sit down at the meal, and the three of us are sitting there, and Andy turns to the three of us, and he says, uh, did you shave or buzz? And my, my first thing, because I traveled that day, is I put my head down, I said, you know, dear Lord, I hope he's talking about our heads at this point, because this could be a very uncomfortable conversation to have right out of the gates. And uh, you can tell by my glowing dome here that I actually shave my head, I don't buzz it. Sam says that he buzzes, and Andy goes, oh, if you buzz your head, you have to get yourself one of these. Oh, sorry, that's not us, that's the blue man group, that's us. He goes, you have to get yourself one of these. Um, and, and now, why, why does he have to get one? Well, it turns out that little blue cylinder that you see is actually a vacuum cleaner. And what happens is as you're buzzing, it sucks in all the hairs that are going everywhere. Now, for, for the women in the room who are laughing at this point, you know exactly why this is the most amazing thing ever, because after your husband, boyfriend, whatever is in the bathroom, and you go in after, and their stuff is everywhere. It's disgusting. Uh, and you're just completely disgusted with your spouse, but you're too proud to usually say anything, or you scream at them, and you get into a big fight, right? Now, what does the old consumer look like? What does the consumer of 24 hours ago look like? You know, you'd hear about a product like this, if you were really into this at that dinner, you'd like send yourself an email or make a note of it on your iPhone or your Blackberry or whatever. Uh, maybe you would you know, send yourself an email about it, who knows if you're really insane about this product. 
the majority of us would do probably nothing. You'd be walking through a department store a couple weeks later and you'd see the buzzer section, you'd go, oh yeah, that crazy guy in Chicago told me about that buzzer, I should check it out, right? But that's not the new consumer. The new consumer is Sam Decker. Sam is sitting at the dinner with his iPhone 4. He's got his Amazon app up. He's also a member of Amazon Prime. Do you guys have Amazon Prime in Germany and Europe? So Amazon Prime, the way it works in the US is it's about 70 bucks a year. Now the cool part about it is one, they'll send you everything as fast as they physically can. Now this is a pretty big deal in some US cities. You can live in New York, San Francisco, LA. If you order it early enough in the morning, the product is sometimes there by lunch. Pretty amazing. The other thing it does is you can send things back, no questions asked. Think about that from a consumer perspective. You can buy lawn furniture, have it set up in your backyard and go, nah, I don't like it, send it back. I mean, they, they've literally turned every single thing into an impulse buy. I mean, this is a huge shift in consumerism that we've not seen in a long time. Forget that. So, as Andy's telling the story of this buzzer during dinner, Sam is on his Amazon app, Prime. He sees it, he reads the reviews, he's like, what do I have to lose? One click buy, done. By the time he travels home from Chicago to Austin the next day, the buzzer will be there. He can try it out and then decide if it's gonna save his marriage or not, right? I mean, uh, the way he was behaving at the conference, I don't think the buzzer's gonna make all that big of a difference. I'm just kidding, he's a good guy. He's a good guy. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Does that sound like a crazy type of consumer that we have never seen before, or is that sort of starting to sound more and more normal? I mean, let's take out the transactional part of it, and let's just look at the pure ordering functionality. The fact that you could just see it and order it and have it. Seems pretty common, right? Let's get some audience participation here. How long do you think it's gonna be before this type of activity by a consumer is completely ubiquitous, meaning everybody is basically doing it off of all their devices? Raise your hands if you think it's gonna be 10 years or longer. Raise your hands if you think it's gonna be five years or longer before this is pretty ubiquitous, this type of thing. Raise your hands if you think two years or longer. Raise your hands if you think under two years. Majority under, so uh, you know, congratulations in my global travels, you're right on par. It's about two years or under is where people sort of get more comfortable with that. So now let's think about this. How many of you are planning business for next year? Raise your hands. I hope all of you, yes, or you're done your planning. <laughs> None of you, you're screwed. Thank you, God bless, good night. <laughs> um, so what are we saying here? It's now. I mean, we're not talking about something you can't see the horizon of. And the other part is I was involved in, in, in this whole web world also for a very long time, much like the previous speaker was. And I can tell you that things are moving a lot faster. I'm on this kick now where I think they're gonna debunk Moore's Law any day. It ain't gonna be, it's doubling, it's gonna be some, it's gonna be a ridiculous number that's gonna, the iPhone 4S basically has the same chip as the iPad. I mean, this technology is moving really, really fast too, isn't it? This world, this type of consumer will be more ubiquitous, more powerful, and we'll be buying more, there'll be more value than anything we've seen to date, including e-commerce and all this stuff. So if you are still grappling with this digital world, the web, www.ecommerce, whatever, this is gonna make that look like a complete joke. It's gonna look like a market correction compared to what this is gonna be. Because you are gonna have this consumer who is not gonna want any other way of doing it. And so what's the reality check of this? People still read books, people still aren't reading books, what's going on? Well, they had a piece of data that came out first that is very, very dramatic because I think this sort of ubiquity of this technology is really driving a new type of consumer. Year on year, what they saw this year is that there was a 73 plus percent, 74 percent growth rather, of consumers who are at a retail establishment using their mobile phones to ask questions or get information about that particular retail establishment. So think about the brands that are trying to embrace Twitter and get Twitter right. What are you gonna do when your consumer's on the floor of your store asking in real time about where's customer service? How come I can't find somebody here? You have this book, where's that book? I mean, these are huge, ginormous shifts that again, we're not even looking at, but they're here. And the growth by the consumer is so powerful. And the message about this big change for me is really this, that this is the first time we've ever seen a consumer more ahead of the marketers, more informed, more connected, and more doing things. And this has been the real challenge that when I'm speaking to marketing professionals or people in, in, in varying industries are really grappling with, the fact that the consumer has never been, one, this advanced, but two, this far ahead of the brands as they are. So, uh, this is the debate actually, and I think this boils down the whole debate about publishing when I look at it. It's either paper or plastic is what I hear. 
Uh, every time I'm invited to speak to publishing, it's all about paper or plastic, right? Uh, when is paper going away? When's it going to be digital? What's it going to look like? And I don't, I'm not necessarily sure that that's the conversation versus the just the true facts of the consumers and how they are. I spent 15 years in the music industry, and I thought, who would want to let go of vinyl? I mean, it was beautiful. You could sit in bed and look at the art. It was amazing. And then CDs came out, and the people complained that the cover art was so bad. And then they were like, who'd want to get rid of the, the actual physicality of it? And boof, it's gone. And I'm not saying that that's going to happen to books or not. It may, it may not, probably will, who knows. But, but the, I don't believe the debate is about paper or plastic. I actually think the debate is about where can I get the content that I want to consume and read, and where does the act of reading a book fall in the skew of, of all these new choices that I have as a consumer. And so this piece of research came out uh, for e-readers, uh, read more from Center for Media Research this past month, actually. And what they actually uncovered is something really fascinating. And I was using myself as a market of one, sort of talking about this, but then the data actually came out, which basically says that 16% of Americans read between 11 and 20 books a year. But among those who have an e-reader, look at that number, it's 32%. People are reading more. Why? Because regardless of whether they have an asynchronous Amazon app where they can just grab a page or two right here and then you know, grab a chapter later, it is a simpler way for people to consume content. And what you're going to see in this sort of little journey that we take together, this is really all about simplicity and how you can give the consumer basically what they want, when they want it, and how they want it. So uh, this is probably a chart you've seen too, which came out very recently. It's talking about this idea of the, the Kindle, and when will the Kindle actually be free based off of data they're saying next year. Uh, makes sense? Well, of course it sort of makes sense, right? You should be paying for the content and what's within it, and who cares about what the platform is. And I mean, we could discuss platforms too, and I think that, you know, that, that whole idea that the platform doesn't matter is probably very, very accurate. People simply want what they want in an easy and simple way to get it. And so we have to figure out now what it is we're going to do as, as, as publishers and marketers to connect our authors to these readers who have become so fragmented and so different in terms of what we've seen. But we haven't really begun to understand what it means. And so do you remember when the first iPad came out and all the criticisms of it? Uh, one criticism was there was no flash, right? Um, there was another criticism that said, oh, there's no camera on this. And then Steve Jobs, may he rest in peace, came down from the mountain with two tablets and delivered an iPad 2 with two cameras on it, right? <laughs> we resolved that issue fairly quickly. And then people still say that, you know, you can't make a call with it. You know how stupid you look trying to make a call with an iPad? You look ridiculous. It's so, so stupid, right? The big thing that the iPad brought is the humanity of technology. I believe this is the first device that actually removes the technology from people. You all have laptops, I'm sure, and you come home and you have the same frustrating experience I do, where you come home to do work and you lift up the lid and you hit power, and then, okay, while it's booting, you take your shoes off and you wash your hands, and you come back, okay, password. You enter your password, you hit enter, you go and start the water on the stove for supper, you come back, the computer crashed, you're like, ah, oh, I gotta reboot again, <laughs> right? You ever install software on your computer? Like, you have all these commands. Keyboards are not easy. We, we take it for granted because we're like really smart, but most, it's complex. Control C, Control V. You've got a mouse, double mouse click, right mouse click. You've got CD ROM. I mean, this is not easy stuff. This device takes away all of that, right? Instant on. You turn it on, it's there. Touch, very, very simple. If you're a salesperson, try taking your computer out, opening it up, putting your keynote presentation, and sitting next to the rep, and you're trying to sell it to and You're like, look at here, look at me. This is really awkward. Take an iPad and sit next to them on the couch and tell me what the experience is like. Uh, this touch and this speed and this connectivity and the untetheredness of how you're constantly connected makes these devices that much more human, much, much, much more like us. And this is why the adoption is the way it is, I believe. And I think that these are the indicators that get me excited as somebody who was trying to get people more excited about connecting their products to consumers. But we look at this and we think, like, how can we build an app for this? Instead of looking at it and saying, how can we use this as a connection tool between what we sell, an author, a book, whatever, and these consumers and bring them closer together? Uh, this is a picture of the cutest human being ever born, actually. Um, <laughs> it's my son. It's not true. Um, I had the second cutest human being ever born six months ago. Um, but this is my son, and this was before he was two years old. Don't worry, he doesn't always wear a helmet. He's um, He's wearing a helmet here because he's playing his motocross app, and the guy wears a red helmet, and he likes to wear the helmet like the guy. Um, one day, I was working from home, and my wife said, come, in, come to the den. I want you to see what your son is doing. How many of you have children? 
So when your wife says, come and see what your son is doing, you know what that's code for, right? <laughs> that's code for you're in a lot of trouble, like your kid's not, because if it's good, it's come and see what our son is doing or come and see what my son is doing. Uh, when it's bad, it's come and see what your son is doing. So I assume my posture, which was like this, and I go to the den, and I walk into the den and I see my son standing in front of our 50-inch screen, and he's going like this on the screen. It gets better. He sees me and he turns back. He's not even two years old, so he's just learning how to talk. And he says, Dada, broken. <laughs> I'm like, for real? It gets worse. Then he looks back and he goes, Dada, broken, angry birds. <laughs> so I'm like busted. Now my wife knows that I'm playing angry birds on my iPad with my son who's not even two years old and she's going to call child services, right? Um, but it was such an amazingly powerful moment for me because I realized that my son is never going to know what a keyboard or a mouse looks like. I mean, he might know what it looks like, but he'll never use a mouse or a keyboard. And it was also just philosophically how he was. It must be broken if it's not doing what it says, what I'm trying to make it do, because that's how he is. Now, you might say that, you know, Mitch, your son is not my customer. Fine. But we have seen this adoption take place in us time and time again. Do you remember when Blackberries first came out? And people said, I could never type with my thumbs. You did pretty good. Congratulations, right? And now the complaints I get when people don't want to switch from Blackberry to Android or iOS is, um, oh, you know, I can't type on glass. You're going to figure it out. You know, you're not going to have a choice. It's, it's the way of the world. And so we have to be able in these stories to pull out something. And what I want publishers to pull out is this. Do not instill your values to date on the world that is about to come. Do not instill your values of today on the world that is about to come. The biggest opportunity you can take is to actually look at these moments and instances and provocations and think, how can we make publishing representative of this new world? The worst thing you can do is fold your arms and say, people will still buy books the way we tell them to. Um, we can't live in this world. Uh, we talk about the only constant is change. So true, the only constant is change, which means it's always changing, and which means there's never a way it was before and a way it was now. The way it was before, if you go back to the 80s, people said the 70s in publishing was a really different time from the 80s. I mean, it's constant. What we have now is this amazing opportunity that we didn't have before that I want people to capitalize on. You might think I'm crazy and I'm wrong. I don't think I am. Uh, this is the data from last quarter from IDC, which is just measuring technology and sales. More smartphones were sold in the last quarter of last year than computers. We are going to see this shift happen very, very powerfully. In fact, when I look out in this room, I can tell you, compared to when I was at a Tools of Change conference three years ago, I see a lot less lids. I see a lot more smartphones, a lot more tablets. We are forgetting that the power in this connectivity and being untethered is very, very profound. And it's something that we just happening very, 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 very fast. So why do I like this and where do I think your big opportunity is? If I get kicked off the stage in two minutes, I don't care. Remember this. It's about real interactions between real human beings. The way in which books are sold is still fundamentally the same. And you know how that is? It works like this. We're having coffee and I say to you, Oh, I just read a book you have to read. Word of mouth, right? Go back to a world prior to mass media broadcasting. And do you know what happened? You would move into a village, and you'd turn to your neighbor, and I would go, Joe, where do I go to get bread? And Joe would say, you need to go speak to Cat the baker who lives down the lane. And the next morning, I would go see Cat the baker, and I would say, Cat, uh, I'm new to the village. I'm Mitch. I need some bread. How big is your family? We'd have a conversation. You'd say, what type of bread do you like? And then every day I would come back and see Kat, and she'd prepare for me this bountiful, baked goods greatness. And then what happened is we had uh, urbanization, and, and we had urban sprawl, and we had cities built, and we had uh, states and provinces and countries and globalization and all this stuff. And suddenly, this advent of mass media. Now, mass media wouldn't have worked like that. I mean, how are you in Frankfurt, Germany, going to go to cat down the lane in the impossible? And so what we did is we pulled the trick. Right? Mass media marketers said, OK, so from now on, your cookies are actually baked by a bunch of elves that lives in trees, uh, the Keebler elves. And, and, and your corn is no longer by the local farmer. Your corn is a jolly green giant who lives in a magical valley. We created these stories so that we could have people unify around them everywhere. It didn't matter where they were from culturally anything like that. It didn't matter. 
And now what we have in this transition, and that's why I love this idea of the social book so powerfully, is you're back to this world that's about this, which is about what gets people excited about books in the first place, real interactions with real human beings, right? Because the truth of the matter is that there could be an interaction happening in that social book program, and the truth is that you could start reading it tomorrow and come in and see that interaction, and you've had a real interaction with real human beings in a completely digital world, right? Suddenly, technology has allowed us to really distribute this technology in a way that we never had before. Your amazing opportunities to actually market and publish books the same way you always have, only leverage that human component that much more because now you can. You have this opportunity to go after them in that way. The challenge for you is to break your mass media mindset of how many. How many people can we put this book in front of? The small percentage of people that would like that book will then buy it and read it. Stupid in this day and age. Now, social platforms, all this stuff, it gives you the right-hand side. Who? You have people, whether it's Google+, LinkedIn, Facebook, whatever, blogs, Goodreads, anything, self-identifying. I like reading nonfiction business books. I'm self-identifying. You, as a publisher of business books, have an opportunity to connect to me. I'm not talking about giving me free stuff. Connect to me. Have a real interaction with a real human being. But we have to get ourselves off of that crazy drug of thinking that it's all about how many people and blasting that message because it has changed. So um, I want to give you some Canadian content because I'm from Canada. Do you, do you, have you ever heard of Kids in the Hall? Very famous sketch comedy group. So I'm going to show you Kids, Kids in the Hall, H-A-U-L. Watch this video for a second. Hey guys, so I'm going to do my most requested video of all time at this moment, and that is an updated what's in my purse video. I'm gonna do this one since I'm here and it's hard to do tutorials. So this is the bag. I know it looks like a suitcase because it's like stuffed full. This is a Balenciaga. This is the giant hardware part-time city bag, I believe. And I got this. Okay, I won't make you endure the torture of that. Um, L, L. Fowler does haul videos, H-A-U-L. Young teenage girls, you know what they do, they go to shopping malls together, and they go through the malls and then they converge to the food court, and they talk about their haul. Whatever they picked up, what was on sale, what was coupon, did you see this, did you see that? Right, through these real interactions with real human beings through these digital channels now, you can put those stories everywhere. And so she records her hauls on YouTube, and you might be shaking your head laughing, going, I can't believe this, but take a little look over here. And look at her over 1 million views for this video. Uh, Elle and her sister do these haul videos. Combined, they have over, get ready for this, 700 million views. Uh, they have representation out of a talent agent in the US, uh, literally doing uh, sponsorship deals and things like that. Tell me something, who's better to talk about a book? You, the publisher, your PR agent, or her? Real interactions with real human beings, telling stories that matter. By the way, not 30 seconds, not two minutes. This video here is over 10 minutes. 10, every intricacy of this bag, the loops, the buckles, the, what it holds, what it, I mean, she knows more about this person than the designer probably thought of. But these are powerful testimonials. And it's transformational when you see this, when you start seeing that people are doing this unsolicited out of the pure passion for the product, you start realizing that your most powerful advocates the champions of your books and products are here, and they're connected. Publishing. Any single human being can have a thought or idea about something and publish that thought in text, images, audio, video, and or instantly and for free to the world. And what rises to the top is whatever is interesting to that little group of people that are interested in it. And if we apply that in a mass media mindset, we can never reconcile the two, which is why we have what I call media purgatory now. We're not in heaven, we're not in hell, we're in purgatory. Because people are trying to say, well, what is this compared to running an ad in the New York Times? Stupid equation. That's a stupid equation. It doesn't make sense. It's not the same equation. And you might think that, well, this is just a bunch of teenage girls and it has no relevance. And it works in a very, very powerful way. I travel all the time and this is my bag. It's the Eagle Creek Tarmac 22. Um, it is an amazing bag because especially when I'm coming to Europe, it's only six pounds when it's empty. Uh, so I can put a lot of stuff in it. I usually pack for a week in this bag. And I was traveling doing my book launch for Six Pixels of Separation with uh, uh, Julian Smith and Chris Brogan, who co-authored another very popular New York Times bestseller called Trust Agents. And we were in Chicago. And I pull up with my bag, and I stop at the terminal, and I'm waiting for the guys, and I see Chris comes up, and he stops with his bag. And you know when your uh, carry-on does that little wobble thing? It's like not balanced properly, and it shakes? 
So his bag shakes, and next thing I know, it like flips over, and his MacBook goes like airborne. So it's in the air. So it's, it's not a MacBook Air. It's actually a MacBook in the air, right? And I'm like, I'm like running at it like a movie, like, no. You know, I grab it, and I'm like, what is going on here? Like, I'm freaking out. We haven't got on the plane yet. And he's like, there's something about this bag. I don't know. I'm like, Chris, you got to get the Eagle Creek Tarmac 22. So we finished this tour, uh, and I come home, and a couple weeks later, I, I, I'm on his blog, and I see he posts this. Hi, I'm Chris Brogan from chrisbrogan.com. I want to show you something as simple as the suitcase I'm using for travel right now. My friend Mitch Joel told me I've got just the suitcase for you because I was complaining about my last carry-on. I had a Samsonite suitcase. You'd think pretty darn good, but mine had a little technical flaw. It also had four wheels and it kept flipping over. The bigger version of the Samsonite worked perfect. The little one, not so much. This is the Eagle Creek Tarmac 25. I want to show you. What <laughs> so he goes through this bag of stuff with his clothes and says, so Who is Chris Brogan? Have you ever heard of Chris Brogan? Very popular marketing blogger, Ad Age, which is the big industry publication in North America, publishes a list of the top 150 blogs on marketing and communications. Uh, I'm a paltry 20 in that world. Chris is number one or two, depending on the day. Him and Seth Godin sort of do this little battling back and forth. This guy's a, quite an influencer. He's a champion of brands. He's right. He does this own thing because he likes it and finds it interesting. So I'm really curious. Like, right, I, I'm talking about this bag. Chris is talking about this bag. Uh, does Eagle Creek know? And so I'm looking around on, on, on Facebook, and I see that Eagle Creek actually has a Facebook page. And so it's, a, it's about 8 o'clock at night, and I post a thing saying, thought you might be interested in this. And Eagle Creek comes back good on them, right? 855, thanks, Mitch, for sharing this. Way cool. And that's it. Now, if you look at this from a mass media point of view, it's a 10 on 10. They were present on Facebook. They had a page. Someone put something. They responded pretty quickly. Check, check, check. If you transform this to this world I'm trying to help everybody understand, this idea of real interactions with real human beings, it falls below 10. Because one is I had to tell them it existed. Right? Brands need to be listening. Publishers need to be listening. Authors need to be listening. There are people out there passionate about your books, about your subjects, and they're talking passionately. It is not their job to follow you on Facebook. It is your job to like them. It is the biggest mass media idea. Like us on Facebook. The hell with you. Like them on Facebook. Like me on Facebook. Like Chris on Facebook. Not because I need free crap. I don't need free crap. I'm an Eagle Creek customer for life. I will sell the, the, their benefits to anybody who will listen. They have an opportunity through these listening tools that everyone can use to connect to their consumer. They have an opportunity to go, Mitch is the same as everyone else on this page. No, Mitch is not the same as everyone else because I am me. And I care, you know, it's the old saying, right? Who's the most important person in the world when you're with your customer? You are the customer. Customer? Yes? No. If someone has to drop dead, who's the most important person in the room at that moment? It's you, right? You know, I hope the other person drops dead. Right? So we say all this stuff, but the truth is we're very self-involved. And, and I, me being a fan of your authors, I'm the most important person in the world, not the author. And this is a big thing that brands don't get. They, haven't, they don't realize. They didn't realize that every time Chris and I tweet or blog about this bag, it sells out. I'm not talking about in a couple places. I'm talking about Amazon, eBags, you name it, sells out. We can clear 50 of these products with a tweet. That's how powerful the content we've created for it is. And on any given day, if you follow me on Twitter, it's Mitch Joel, you will see on any given day, three or four people will say, what was that bag you told me about? <laughs> uh, suddenly, I'm the TV spot for these people, right? And I'm not criticizing Eagle Creek. It's a mindset of Eagle Creek wanted me to like them when Eagle Creek should be liking me. And I think the publishers would do very well in embracing that world. Because the mindset that you have is crazy. Think about it this way. You're going to sit here all day. How many thousands of people online will be looking for a book about one of the authors you have or is interested in the topic that you have pub books published for? Probably thousands. And the question is, is when they're looking for that, are you there? I mean, really there. Because what you're doing is taking ads in all the newspapers and all these big places in hopes that people see them and then go to a bookstore or buy it or whatever. But the truth is, is that there are very, very few publishers who are active and listening to the people who are raising their hands and saying, I'm about to take a flight. What book should I read? I love thrillers. What should I read? I love, uh, has anyone read the new Tom Peters? But on and on and on. And publishers are simply just not present in these conversations. I'm a sales guy. Tell me, would I rather just walk around the streets of Frankfurt going, who needs a digital marketing strategy? Or would I rather be present when people say, I need a digital marketing strategy? 
It's the basics of sale. And everyone's like, man, how important could this be? It's embarrassing. The other transition, the other provocation, I'll end on this, is this idea of direct relationships. Um, choose a, a major company. Well, let's choose a random one, L'Oreal Cosmetics. You're familiar with L'Oreal Cosmetics? Every single year, you know what happens to L'Oreal? The people that they're selling to, the retailers, are less and less. There's consolidation, and there's this little company called Walmart and Tesco and Costco. And you know what Walmart and Tesco and Costco do? Have you ever been in a price negotiation with them? Oh, it's not a negotiation. They tell you what's going to happen what your profits are going to be, how you're going to ship to them, how you're going to deal with them, when it's going to happen. They dictate terms. This has never happened before. Now, if you go online and look at it as a consumer, what do you see? You see L'Oreal and all their brands trying to get you to like them on Facebook, and then you see Walmart trying to get you to like them on Facebook. Who owns the customer? Your customer. You're buying a book. Who owns it? Do you as the publisher own the relationship, or does the retailer who sells the book own the relationship? See, this, this idea of direct relationships suddenly becomes very <coughs> profound and powerful. The best brands, the smartest brands, what I think will be the best publishers, are the ones who are developing direct relationships with their customers, with the readers. And the only way to do this is for, the, for it to be that real interaction with real human beings. People lament Apple about how great they are, especially the retail. I actually believe Apple's smartest move for retail was to have the direct relationship. People don't talk about this, but that is the reason. Apple knew that if somebody walks into a Best Buy or whatever retailer you have out here, and they can look at a slew of laptops, a $500 Dell or a $500 HP or a $2,000 MacBook Pro, forget it. And whichever company is paying for the ads that, that week and that's the ones they have to sell, that's who the sales rep is going to push. They said, eh, 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 eh. we're going to have the direct relationship with the customer. They're going to speak to us about it. And we'll have resellers for sure. That was the big win here. You have a tremendous opportunity today, right now, and if you do nothing else in Tools of Change or as you head into the book fair, start figuring out what you're going to be doing today as a marketer to build direct relationships with the customer. Because I'm telling you, if you don't, the authors will, which may be fine for you. If you don't, the retailers will. And, if, and by retailers, by the way, I mean the digital ones as well. You have the opportunity now to have a direct relationship. And so watch the battle unfold right now. Go onto Facebook and look at brands. Look at brands like H&M. Look at brands that sell through retailers. And you tell me if they're not battling for that customer like, for that customer relationship. Whether they're fulfilling on it and doing it well is irrelevant. They're battling it out. I believe you should own that direct relationship with the customer. Very, very quickly, my six points of separation, how to bring this all together. One is accept it. Uh, we talked a lot about this at dinner last night, this idea like, do publishers really accept this digital world? Um, I actually think that publishers are going into the digital world the same way marketers went into it, kicking and screaming. Uh, no embracing of it. Very few companies truly, I mean, really going into it with, wow, what an amazing opportunity. You mean we can sell books to people anywhere and everywhere? Like right now, I could go on and buy every single book I want. Wow. No, 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 no. We've got, uh, we've got publishing laws. We've got geography. We've got, we've got stores. Well, what about this person? Somebody opened up the funnel and said, you can sell them anything anywhere, and we're fighting it. Is this normal? Is this a really normal way to react? I, I, you, your value chain just extend, expanded exponentially, not laterally, exponentially. And we fight it. It's, it's the craziest thing. So please accept it. Two is, it's not one way or the other. I don't believe it's going to be um, everything will die in traditional advertising, and it's only going to be online and social media. I don't believe that. I like to say everything is with, not instead of. You have been doing things very, very successfully. There will be a baseline of that type of business. But there is this brand new world, these tools of change, and your opportunity to actually take them and use them to become better are right there for you for, for the taking. The beautiful thing is you don't have the gatekeeper. So now it's not a publisher who's dictating back to you what you're going to pay for this. You can do this for free in terms of the interaction. The time and the expense of, of building it is a whole other story. Everything is with, not instead of. Point number three is open. You're going to hear a lot about open source and open platforms. I take open a different way. I see it more as, as a publisher, as someone connecting to consumers. How open are we? How open are we to the discourse? How open are we to allowing them to do things? How open are we to letting them do stuff with this content on their own? So thinking about it more, less from, from your platform, but more from how you actually approach consumers. Think about open houses. What about, what if you did a digital open house? Come in at any time, just look at our stuff. Rate it, review it, tell us how we're doing. Recommend. Show us things. You read our stuff all the time. You know probably better than we do. 
Social media is a conversation. I don't know. Uh, I'm probably the only guy in the digital world who would say that I'm not sure if social media is about a conversation. Social, the act of being social is twofold. The only way something is social is if you make it shareable and findable. Don't worry about conversations yet. Start making everything you do as shareable and as findable as possible. If your stuff is as shareable and as findable as possible, people will talk about it. They will then engage with you. Then, if you're really awesome, if you are a ninja black belt, they may, perhaps, I doubt it, have a conversation with you, a real conversation. Brands think engagement is conversation, and it's not. The brands that are making their content as shareable and as findable as possible have a very good engagement with consumers. Very, very few of them have any real semblance of what looks like a conversation to me. However, when you do this well, shareable, findable, you create a platform by which people can have conversation. And that, in and of itself, is very powerful. So opening it up and, and having the platform where people can converse is where you want to ideally go. The last one should be easy for you. I don't know why publishers struggle with this. Marketing as a platform, as a broadcast mechanism, works. When you look at the social sphere of things, what I'm looking at it from is more like from the publisher side. How can I create valuable content for the consumer? So if you go to my blog, Six Pixels, what you see is not me shilling the wares of Twist Image or what we offer. You, you wouldn't even know by looking at my blog. I'm writing it like a journalist. I'm trying to provide valuable content for businesses, and that includes publishers, of this new world and opportunities of things you can do to make more money. Now, I've been talking to you for about 30 minutes. Did I mention technology once? No. Your readers don't care about technology. Go sit down with someone and ask them what e-reader they use or what e-app they use. or what the, They don't even know what the hell you're talking about. What they want is simplicity. You have an amazing opportunity here to create a platform by which people can read content, consume content, interact with content. Make it simple. I mean, go back and look at your apps. Go back and look at your platforms. Go back and look at your websites and ask yourself, if I were a consumer who used to walk into a store and browse and buy a book, is that the same experience when I come here? Or am I suddenly caught in the world of business to business terminology? We provide end to end solutions for publishers that have the best opportunity to optimize and re I mean, what? That, what are you talking about half the time? The reason Twitter, Google Plus, any of these things work is because it's simple. Try and make your platforms as simple and as fun as possible. So I know Kat was kind enough to let me speak because I have to run out in about 45 minutes and catch a plane. Um, and we're not doing Q&A, but I am actually very, very social and I do like Q&A. So if you would like to connect with me, the next slide is all of my contact information. Um, it's my email address. It's my Twitter feed. It's my website. It's everything you need to know about me is right here. So all you have to do is do a search for Mitch Joel. You'll see my home phone number is there, my address. I mean, everything you want is there. Um, I thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you. Um, I enjoy publishing so much. I wish you a great day and a great fair, and thank you very much.